Okay, I just request everyone to be on mute except for Shai, sir. Just give me a second, sir. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. You're live now. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for participants and faculty all around the world. Welcome to Asia Pacific Hip Society, which is a section of Asia Pacific Orthopedic Association. We are starting a series of webinar, and the first webinar is on total hip arthroplasty in post-traumatic hip. We'll have a series of webinar. Uh, we have faculty from all around, very senior faculty from all around the world, including UK, Ireland, India, Pakistan, Indonesia, Philippines, and Malaysia. Um, we plan to do a lot of activity, including series of workshop, live and cadaveric surgery workshop on primary and revision hip arthroplasty, also, we plan to identify a center of excellence where fellowship could be offered to members. We also plan to have a visitation for senior faculty going to center of excellence for short visitation, seeing state of art surgery, including robotic or specialized implant. So welcome to uh, the webinar. I'm going to hand over to Abe Allianz, who is the general secretary of Asia Pacific Hip Society. He is going to introduce the first speaker, and then we'll take question and answer at the end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shahid, sir, and welcome everyone uh, onto the program today. Very uh, delighted to have uh, a galaxy of lovely faculty. So the first talk uh, is going to be by the past president of APOA, Dr. David Chun, and he's going to speak to us on THA in fractionic femur indications and outcomes. David. Hello, fellow hip surgeons. Many thanks to Professor Shahid Noor and the APHS for inviting me to talk about my favorite subject, which is how we manage hip fractures in the elderly population. I think many of you already know that I'm pretty biased towards a fully cemented total hip replacement, which I think works better than almost anything in atroplasty of the hip in the Asian population. But I think this should be really performed by surgeons who know what you're doing and not by tired residents and with, in the presence of tired anesthetic residents in out-of-hours operating theatres. I first began to talk about this subject in 2002 and 2003, uh, but this is some of the data on which I base those initial talks. This is a publication in 2006, which in fact was initially reported in 2003 in the Cochrane Library, in which Parker and Gurusami compared internal fixation versus arthroplasty for subcapital femoral neck fractures. To be fair, there was not very much to base a Cochrane uh, analysis on. There were just 19 trials. Quite a lot of patients were included in this but there was considerable variation in how patients were treated and the risk of selection bias uh, was very high. It was only low in three trials and also in some of these trials, a very inappropriate implant, the uncemented more prosthesis was used. We now know that the results of those implants was not very good. Not surprisingly, they discovered that internal fixation has got less morbidity uh, when compared with arthroplasty for this patient population. However, the revision rate was significantly higher. And so if you're going to sub submit a very sick and elderly person to a revision, uh, that's not going to be very good. So that was the conclusion. Internal fixation is less uh, morbid on patients, but uh, they couldn't decide whether there was any big difference 
between residual deformity and pain uh, in those two groups. And they suggested better studies should be carried out. This is just one example of the papers they analyzed. Um, this is a paper reported in injury in 1989 uh, by Skinner, um, in which displaced subcapital capital fractures of the femur were randomized to be treated by internal fixation, hemiatroplasty, and total hip replacement. Quite a lot of patients were treated, and you can see the implants that we use here as kind of DHS type device, a more hemiatroplasty, and a house semi captive prosthesis. The more hemiatroplasty, as we know, does not have good results, but neither does the house semi captive prosthesis. Certainly not in my experience. And one year after the operation, a lot of patients were no longer with us, uh, and there were some general complications that were to, to be recorded. However, 25% uh, of the patients receiving internal fixation, fixation had their fixation revised. Um, of uh, the mores and the house prosthesis inserted, there was a more or less equivalent revision rate, but uh, their impression was that total hip replacement resulted in the least pain and the most mobility at one year, uh, whereas the hemiatroplasty, which is a more hemiatroplasty, was worse in those respects. Not unsurprising, really. Ravi Kumar, around the same time, reported their 13-year review of patients who had had the same uh, combination of treatments. And this was not particularly randomized, it was just a review. And you can see here that overall mortality was pretty high in that group because many of these were old patients. Uh, but you can see here that those who had an ORF, one third of them were revised and actually their scores were reasonable in, in total uh, and certainly better than those of the hemiatroplasty group. Um, certainly there were some revisions in the hemiatroplasty group but the fewest revisions occurred in the THR group which had the best Harris score but also the highest dislocation rate. Gephardt and Amstutz did a similar study that compared hemiatroplasty to total hip arthroplasty. And when you look at the hemiatroplasties, uh, half, uh, half of those operations were uncemented, half of them were cemented, and uh, about a third of them had a total hip arthroplasty. Um, pretty much the groups were comparable. Uh, but over a period of follow-up of 56 months, the best scores were with the total hip replacements. One of the arguments was that if the cartilage is very good, we shouldn't be replacing it with some kind of prosthesis. Uh, this is a study done by Daldorf et al., which looked at degeneration of human articular cartilage after hemiatroplasty in revised patients. Certainly, there's a bias selection of patients here, but when you compare the histological specimens of uh, acetabular cartilage in patients who are undergoing revision and match them to an age matched control patients who are having primary arthroplasties, there was certainly quite a lot of wear. And this uh, correlated with the time uh, over which the implant had been in situ. When I looked for this data again for this talk, Actually, I found this. It just says, we want to study this thing again. That's our protocol, but nothing more than that. So I did a literature search and turned up this article written by Mohit Bandari and company uh, in the 2019 Journal of uh, New England Journal of Medicine. And here, they report their multinational, multi-center study, 10 countries, 80 centers, 1,495 pre-morbidly ambulant patients over a 24-month period of follow-up and looked at various factors. Um, the primary endpoints studied were these things, dislocation, fracture, implant exchange, implant removal, implant adjustment, and soft tissue procedure, and, uh, and, and other, any other complications there were are judged to be so by a central adjudication committee. Uh, sanitary endpoints were uh, death, etc., 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 and assessments of function and quality of life with WOMAC, EQ5D, SF12, and TUG scores. 
you can see here that actually hemiatroplasty is pretty equivalent to total hip atroplasty in that particular series. And since it was actually a randomized study over many countries, it seems to have some validity to that. Um, so, you know, what my orig original imp uh, impression was that total hip was not as good as, uh, was better than uh, hemiatroplasty may not be that true. Certainly, there are more dislocations if you do a total hip uh, in this group of patients. But by the same token, there are more implant failures in the hemiatroplasty group. And those of you have, who have tried to revise a hemiatroplasty in this very sick group of patients will find that that's not such a great thing to do. Um, this is just the secondary endpoints, which shows that the main difference between the two groups is hip instability. What does the Australian uh, NJR have to say about this? Well, the hip registry of Australia says that actually what's gaining traction is bipolar hemiatroplasty, and what's losing traction is unipolar monoblockia Thompson's prosthesis and things like that. And here it is, you can see how bipolar has got a much lower revision rate than the other two types of hemiatroplasties. So if you're going to do a hemiatroplasty, you should be doing a bipolar. Uh, I, this used to be what a lot of people believe in the early 2000s, but I didn't really quite go for it because the evidence at that point uh, was that both were pretty equivalent. And when you compare those uh, patients treated for uh, hip fractures uh, by total conventional hip replacement or total arthroplasty. Actually, the revision, the revision rate is about equivalent to a bipolar. So all in all, uh, you can choose to do a total hip replacement or a bipolar hemiarthroplasty in this group of patients and you get pretty equivalent results. So thank you again for inviting me. Uh, I will look forward to your questions. Thanks, David, for a lovely talk, and you finished uh, well ahead of time. Uh, we are very grateful to you for that. So there is a question in the chat box, uh, but I think uh, we have a talk addressing that question. So uh, uh, we will address, take the question after Dr. Sadag's talk, because that question basically pertains to his talk. So moving forward, I would now like to request our second speaker, uh, Andito Vibisono uh, from Indonesia, and he will be talking on socket reconstruction techniques in uh, PFN and DHS cutout. All yours, Andito. Uh. Uh, thank you for the organizing committee. Sorry, uh, I have problem with my PowerPoint. Uh, today I want to talk about the socket reconstruction technique in PFN and DHS uh, cutout. Uh, for as we know, that total hip replacement is a surface operation for failed hip fracture fixation. It's a standard uh, of choice for old patient, but in young patient. Reoperation with internal fixation for non union trochal refracture has been reported to have a good result. So, uh, for planning of this operation, uh, we need an x ray. Uh, usually, uh, most of the time, pelvis AP is enough. Sometimes we have to do judy view to look whether there is some problem in the uh, posterior column or in the under column or in the wall. Yeah, but maybe CT scan is uh, more helpful for uh, major osteolysis and pelvic bone loss. And the 3D CT can improve a preoperative understanding in severe complicated uh, bony defect, and we can select the appropriate reconstruction implant and augment. Yeah. Uh, as we know that the internal fixation failure can cause malunion, then union, uh, femoral head osteonecrosis, uh, progressive arthritis due to internal fixation failure and infection. So 
uh, just be precaution if we plan for uh, total hip replacement. If there is some conclusion, whether there is some infection or not, be prepared with the uh, cemented dynamic uh, spacer block like uh, in this picture. Now we come to the clinical difficulties. Uh, uh, we, usually we have holes after we remove the hardware and the malunion and the authority of proximal fracture can make us a loss of the landmark for total hip replacement and also loss of bone stop. There is some regional osteopenia. The bone is not uh, as hard as in the primary uh, total hip replacement and there is a lot of fibrosis and Due to muscle weakness, the problem of uh, dislocation sometimes occur. The operative procedure that we done, usually we do a posterior lateral approach. We di dislocate before removing the implant. This will reduce the risk of uh, shaft fracture. But if dislocation is difficult, uh, femoral neck osteotomy can be done after removing the implant. The astoloma is exposed by retracting the proximal femur anteriorly, but if it's difficult, you can cut the insertion of gluteus maximum on the posterior of femur. Uh, the complication uh, we can have during the operation intraoperative fracture because the bone is very osteoporotic. And after the surgery, uh, dislocation can occur uh, no matter how good you are and how many implant you put, the dislocation can still happen. And then if the uh, structural allograft is not is absorbed by the body, sometimes if you use a uh, uh, you can make a fixation failure. And the worst thing is if they have uh, infection. Yeah. So uh, this is the, the aim of the a stable reconstruction for all uh, hip replacement is to obtain stable and durable fixation of the socket in hip arthroplasty, reestablish the center of the rotation and restore bone stock. So in dealing with the stable defect uh, in this presentation, usually uh, the stable the defect is not very big. So you see, you can use a uh, impacted bone graft and cemented cuff with multiple screw. Sometimes it's complex. Uh, you have to comment cafeteria and semifinal defect uh, without superior coverage. You have to use a structural allograft protected by kids. Uh, for, of course, if the patient can afford, you can use a new porous metal cup. Uh, 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 that uh, come from Zimmer Bi Biomet, they call it a tantalum or trabecular metal. Uh, this metal augment is a uh, can direct in growth of host bone, no resorption, no disease transmission, and uh, but the problem is uh, very expensive, and most of the patient uh, cannot afford to get that. Yeah. Uh, like I said, the rec second reconstruction most of the time is not difficult. We just remove the granulomatous tissue and visceral membrane, remove the astabulum, drill the sclerotic bone, curate the subcarnal bone seat, isolate the cafeteria defect. You can densely pack with a morsel board graft, use a restore streaming. And then uh, we, I will discuss with uh, you some of my cases. This is a male. 60 years old, the problem is have so many comorbidities. We uh, have a problem with uh, posterior uh, intertrochanter fracture is very comminuted, though I can uh, fix it very well. And I asked him to uh, use wheelchair for the first one month, but he kept walking and he is a heavy smoker. And he came again with this kind of procedure. For this kind of patient, uh, I can only do a hemiarthroplasty because uh, the limitation of the economy of the patient. And then uh, because it's non-compliant patient, I'm very afraid about dislocation. Of course, the, if the best option is to do, is to do hemiarthroplasty. This is the picture at the far right is a uh, 
four months after the operation, although the wire for the greater tuberosity is not fixed well, but the patient can walk uh, very stable without any, any sign of dislocation. This is the other cases. Uh, is very straightforward. Is a uh, AVN after uh, PFNA, and we do a uh, ordinary total hip replacement. This is another case. Is a very old patient, and the head of the femur is only thirty seven. So I just can do a bipolar, and then because she is very old, uh, I choose to do a bipolar instead of total hip replacement. This is the other cases. Uh, uh, during the operation, there is some big hole in the medial and the posterior part. Uh, and then the surgeon used kids with impacted bone graft using a cemented cup. Yeah. This is the case that we can have nowadays. You can see that all the screws is uh, locking screws. And so it, this is not ordinary locking screws, it's multidirectional locking through so it make uh, can make uh, your work easier this is the other case uh, 87 years old after pfna and then the surgeon using a modular uh, hip stem with a cemented uh, cup this is uh, the other cases that i borrow from professor abe uh, this is a case with a uh, defect in the uh, astora side and then as you see in the picture uh, use a uh, impacted bone graft with structural aloe graft uh, taken from the head and fix it with the screw it's a standard procedure uh, and then he use a uh, uh, cemented cup yeah uh, and because I like I said that during the operation you can have fracture, so during uh, the preparation there is some airline fracture. So he fix it with distal uh, femoral locking plate, and this is the condition after two months and two three months. Uh, the patient is still in a good condition. This is the. Uh, Last cases, uh, this case uh, also. And it's a, we have just half a minute left for you. Yeah, sorry. Uh, this is uh, with a astabulum defect. So uh, we have to reconstruct the astabulum defect uh, with the uh, allograph, impacted bone graph, and then uh, we he use a dual mobility uh, total hip replacement. Yeah, I think uh, that's all uh, for today. Thank you. So I have to stop screen sharing, Andito. Thank you very much for a very lovely talk. Uh, uh, I have a question on the chat box uh, for uh, Dr. Andito. And uh, uh, it says, which approach for total hip is better for comminuted fractures with an osteoporotic fracture of the greater trochanter in the elderly? So your, your uh, view on the above. Andito, there is a question. Yeah. Can you take it? Yeah, yeah, so, I do a posterior approach uh, because posterior approach, I think you can see everything on, uh, except the anterior column. Dr. Sedang, your talk is on the same. So can I just ask you for a quick opinion on, on the above? Which approach for THA is better for comminuted osteoporotic trochanter fractures in the elderly? Um, I also do either transtrochanteric or posterior approach for the for comminuted um, uh, intertrochanteric fractures. So, and uh, I make sure to reattach the greater trochanter to the uh, distal fragment or the femoral shaft. Okay, so uh, just another opinion. May I request Dr. Malotra, sir, for his opinion on the same, which is your preferred approach, sir? So I agree it is um, uh, transtrochanteric is the easiest one. You can have the entire exposure, just reflect the trochanter up. But you may have to release some of the uh, posterior soft tissue attachments to the greater trochanter. So I would say you can call it posterior, you can call it uh, transtrochanteric, 
but that's the approach to go and uh, we would use a stem where we can tie the trochanter either wagner or mp stem or something which allows you to reattach the trochanter that's actually most important particularly whether you have gone trans trochanteric or you've gone by posterior approach but these will be the two uh, preferred approaches Absolutely. So that actually answers another question which the same person has asked: Is does gyotmi make revision impossible? It doesn't, as uh, uh, all three speakers have alluded to. So. Okay, we can't hear you. So moving on, I would like to uh, invite Dr. Ramesh Sen, who is the president of the Indian Orthopedic Association, for his talk on socket reconstruction in neglected acetabular fractures. Dr. Sen, sir. Thank you, Dr. Shahid, Dr. Abey. So the construction regarding the neglected acetabular fractures, we take it as a part of a traumatic hip, and if we know from the literature, these cases will have. complications higher chances after replacement and when we look at the data after acetabulum fractures uh, this is a study where they selected 10 from 10 studies the 448 patients higher incidence of heterotopic ossification loosening infection and five year survival is also not that high now why so because we understand that when we talk about an acetabulum fracture we are talking about a distorted anatomy we are talking about probably defects there we are looking at a case where the femur head is either subluxated or dislocated we are looking where the acetabulum wall fragments are displaced and there could be one of those complications there now what all this makes now defining a version defining inclination is likely to be difficult because of the fragments displacements soft tissue balancing is likely to be altered because there will be adhesions there will be contractures due to the displacement of that acetabular area there could be a leaf length issue offset issue and again coming back to the same point the defects are likely to alter around these things so when we look and compare these post acetabulum fractures vis a vis a revision we are looking at an acute loss of the bone where in a chronic we in the revision we have a chronic loss incidentally the bone quality is usually good in acetabulum fracture which may not be as good in a revision scenario anatomically we can find out the kind of a fracture displacement where incidentally posterior wall injury is the most common thing which is not there usually in a revision scenario the displacements can be there and pelvic discontinuity all these things can be there now we look at it if we are looking at the most common scenario that is the posterior wall or posterior we might need various things the main difference in a neglected acetabulum fracture vis a vis revision is that we have a femur head available as a graft for reconstruction so our need of using a trabecular metal or any other graft is relatively less because the femur head is available but we might use cage we might use the match also or impression grafting now i go with the scenarios there could be a scenario where it is a old fracture just like this patient 6 years old fracture posteriorly subluxated hip now coming after 6 years where if you open it up you don't have to do much you just ream it properly get your hip in the proper place and you can have a reasonably good outcome in the patient another case Uh, it is a 12 years old neglect of the acetabulum fracture with the mal united acetabulum and you can see it over there that there is an adequate amount of a bone stock available so what do you need to do you just go properly you don't have a dearth of the bone around and you can have a reasonably good outcome of this kind of a situation but there will be cases where these columns have not united at all they were neglected patients kept on coming this is the case you can see a frank non union of the posterior column at that junction so what do you do now you need to reconstruct that part by putting a plate and then to do a thr and that is what we have done in this case another situation of the similar kind where there is a displacement of the column which had to be fixed now you cannot correct this column because they are mostly mal united by the time we reach them and in this case we will have to fix in situ subsequently construct that posterior wall from the femur head and then do the stability of the replacement and this is the 3 years follow up of the case and this is a 6 years follow up doing well 
with the displaced column which was not united initially but there could be a situation when there is a loss of the bone from the area now you need not only the plate you need to reconstruct the wall and incidentally as i told because femur head is available in many of these cases you can have this condition here because the posterior wall is lost he use a femur head as a support fix with the plate create a good acetabulum over there and can put a cup over there another case with the same situation posterior totally lost you can see in the 3d ct total loss you need to reconstruct it so our construction now is getting graft putting up a plate and then getting back to the acetabulum fixation there could be much more complicated that the posterior column is significantly displaced and that to in a young boy now he is a 19 years young boy you do not want to do but he has got a limping gait now in this situation when we opened it up head was bad but still it was sufficient enough to build up now you can't change column also because they are so displaced so you need to reconstruct it so we reconstructed this posterior column put up this plate and then this is his two years follow up is much better uh, in his ability to walk around he doesn't have a limp over left over there also he is quite happy with this kind of a situation now we come another situation where there is a anterior medial support is gone because primarily it is a anterior type of a fracture with a medial defect now these cases one is very simple you have got a lot of graft coming out of the femur head you graft it put up into this area and do because posterior stability is usually good you can do a replacement comfortably there could be a further worse situation now this is 3 years old acetabulum fracture where everything is badly comminuted you don't have any floor left walls so whatever you do you take lot of bone which is formed all around is heterotopic ossification again you reconstruct the total area use a mesh for reconstruction and after creating that mesh you create a base for that impacted graft base reconstruct superior wall reconstruct posterior wall and then you can put a cup and you see how beautifully the pelvis also tilts back to normal see after this thing another significant now the hip center is altered now this is a 16 years old neglected case where you have to go further realign it refix it and so that your pelvis also starts tilting back to normal this is a 2 years follow up then further the pelvis the acetabulum is broken significantly you don't have a base to go so what we need to do we need to reconstruct the acetabulum here i used an extensile iliofemoral approach reconstructed the acetabular roof and thereafter i could get him the replacement at that level the discontinuity which can happen in a transverse fracture t type fracture and if it happens acutely after a trauma is a another event now this is a case where the traction was the only treatment and unfortunately this traction has given infection also so we went for removing the pins putting up a graft over there and then we did reconstruction by getting a allograft and then subsequently using a cage and thereafter the cup over there so we have got an experience of about 229 cases in last 10 years and you what you notice you notice 50 practically 50% of the cases has been neglected cases and these neglected cases do have advantage of femur head but there is a significant effect if you look on the next slide over here you see when you see the total amount of a 66% have a defect problem as compared to reconstructed cases where this defect comes to 43% the advantage here is of this graft in these cases which are primarily central anterior superior cases discontinuity peripheral defect very important is this posterior and posterior superior defect so when you come to reconstructions again we have used structural autograft maximal in these cases which were neglected not in the reconstructed cases where there was enough bone and accordingly we used almost all we used cemented also uncemented also cemented dual mobility also in all these cases and when in the analysis we did analyze them we could get 106 patients where we could test their eq 5d scores most of our patients had reasonably good level of mobility good self care activities usual activities pain discomfort was there little higher number of cases anxiety and depression was only involving to when we got to them their best health imagine we had 58% doing excellent 25% and 19% till 80 so this is the kind of the outcome we can expect in these cases and that is what we have been subsequently able to publish our data and we feel 
that these cases do give us a reasonable outcome. In these cases, we could get good hereditary scores. We could get this thing. So, in a neglected estabular fracture, we may have to have a good planning done, where we are looking for defect. We are looking for all the problems of displacements. But if we are able to carefully execute it, we usually get good results despite all these technical challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, absolutely bang on time. And I have a few questions. Uh, so I'll start with the questions which have appeared later and they're specifically for your talk, sir. Uh, why is there such a high percentage of neglected cases? So very quick comment on it, sir. Considering the availability of fracture care and considering the population, there are the two things here, huge population and not taken care of because our all surgeon mostly were giving only the fraction as a treatment. So most of these cases were not treated. So we had, that is the high percentage when they get complications, they come. Thank you, sir. And another question pertaining to your talk is your post-operative protocol in patients where you've had to do an acetabular reconstruction with a total hip replacement. So when do you mobilize and ambulate these patients? The non-weight bearing ambulation is started after two days, three days, but it's a non-weight bearing, or you can say just a ground touching without a weight, expecting, depending upon the patient's perception and his ability to grasp the rehabilitation protocol. By six weeks, they are reasonably able to put weight. By 12 weeks, we tend to make them comfortable on the ground. But if uh, we feel doubtful about the stability in a situation, we may prolong it, maybe double the time of it. But a lot depends on the kind of a stability we have achieved on the table and the kind of the patient's perception of his abilities. Thank you so much, sir. And another question which I would like to quickly address to Dr. Rehan and uh, Mehul. Uh, treatment regimen for a symptomatic hypertrophic non-union. So I guess you see a lot of these. Uh, Rehan, your call first. Very quick. Uh, we don't that. see a lot of them. We, I'm an anterolateral approacher, so I do see a small amount of heterotrophic ossification over the years, which has gone down since we have started using transaminic acid. Um, I haven't seen many symptomatic. I do have patients who were infected and they have huge heterotrophic ossification. I think prevention is the best approach. So if you are worried about somebody, then start them on anti-inflammatories, have a good hemostasis when you're operating. I think transaminic acid really helps to reduce that um, uh, incidence. But excising, I don't have a huge experience excising it, but I think the the, the radiation works too, you know. Okay, thanks, Rahan. Your quick take on it, Mez. Yeah, Symptomatic sure. so, hypertrophic non-unions. How do you Yeah, know? that's right. So um, again, prevention is best, but if you've got it, um, I you know, I think the two key issues are number one, waiting for it to mature. So you've got to wait, um, you know, sometimes a year, sometimes a bit longer, because you don't want to um, be in a position where you've excised it early and actually it's still maturing and it will keep forming. Um, and then the second thing is what you um, give the patient afterwards or before in that perioperative period. And I think the evidence shows that actually um, radiation is the only thing um, that that um, is evidence to to try and minimize the risk of it re recurring. So that's what we do. The issues we have is we have to send them to a different hospital for the radiation. Okay. Any any particular tips on the time when you want to irradiate it, irradiate these patients? Yeah. Uh, so uh, early. So within that um, initial twenty four hour period, that's what we try and do. Absolutely. That's a great point. David, do you see a lot of uh, hypertrophic, symptomatic hypertrophic uh, uh, non-unions and uh, uh, HOs? No, no, I think this is an heterolateral approach. We use approaches that are not too aggressive on bone and soft tissues, uh, basically because uh, we are on, you know, we just take care. And um, maybe tranexamic makes a difference. Um, I do use tranexamic acid, but I really don't know if it makes a difference because long before I used tranexamic acid, I never had this kind of problem. So maybe it's just my population. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> but I don't, okay, I don't great. see it. So maybe I can request Dr. Malhotra, sir, to address this question quickly after his talk. So moving on, uh, I would request uh, Professor Rajesh Malhotra, sir. He's the uh, 
professor and head of the department at the All India Institute uh, of Medical Sciences in New Delhi and the uh, uh, chair of the uh, JP and Apex Trauma Center in India. So his he shall be talking to us on socket reconstruction in unsalvageable acetabular fractures. So. Thank you, uh, Professors Noor and Abhay. It's a pleasure and an honor. Um, the tragedies are unavoidable, but sometimes they happen too fast, uh, and Yaman may need uh, a hip replacement quite soon after the fixation. And uh, this particular study showed that for posterior wall fractures, uh, there was a higher chance of uh, survivor of um, uh, survival of a uh, total hip replacement compared to uh, the internal fixation at 4.5 years. Uh, so why are we still reluctant to do an acute total hip replacement? That's because uh, of papers like this, which show that there's lower survivorship and more complications. But the catch is that all these papers have actually considered delayed total hip replacement. And we know that the results are uh, not as good as uh, those done for other indications. Um, but when we consider the acute THR, the results are similar to those of delayed THR. So that's no reason not to do it acutely in the carefully selected patients where it's indicated. The literature on the total hip replacement is sparse and they are mostly retrospective studies. But it has been mentioned, uh, what are we losing if we delay the total hip? So we may lose the femoral head, very often it's resolved. We may face poorer bone stock as compared to acute situation. And then the hardware and the risk of infection are actually the problems. So the learning objectives of this talk is the role of acute total hip replacement in unsalvageable acetabular fractures, choice of implants, special considerations in elderly, bone defect management and complications. In the young, the reason for doing an acute THR is the damage to the femoral head and acetabular uh, acetabulum, uh, severe comminution, pre-existing hip arthritis, fractures with poor prognosis and elderly people. So there are factors related to the fracture configuration, patients related to uh, factors related to patient, particularly in the elderly uh, with acute uh, pelvic discontinuity, osteoporosis or low demand patients and the external factors. And most of the fractures in this study were posterior wall or the transverse with posterior wall. The challenges are because of the distorted anatomy, acute bed loss, uh, the acetabular component malposition, high risk of dislocation, a stable fixation is difficult due to combination and there's a need for special implants and instruments and of course the risk of aseptic loosening. Uh, we need special tools and wares. So first one is the newer porous uh, metals and uh, they are actually either titanium or tantalum and they aggregate thrombocytes and encourage also integration and there are uh, a lot of uh, literature available on uh, good endurance against aseptic loosening. When we are using these cups, we have to wedge them between the anterior superior and the posterior inferior parts of the socket. The fixation here and here is only secondary and it has been shown, particularly in the elderly, that there may be corridors available for um, fixation in elderly where it's mostly the anterior column fracture. So 99% patients in this particular uh, uh, study had at least two zones available for screw fixation. So this is a patient uh, treated with porous metal cup. It was uh, comminuted uh, fracture dislocation with transfers with posterior wall. And then this is how it was reconstructed. And you can see the follow up. Everything got consolidated very well. Another example, fracture dislocation, again treated with porous metal cup. And the third patient who was an alcoholic uh, liver disease with polytrauma also had this uh, porous metal cup for reconstruction and did very well. We have our own series of acute total hip following uh, with the uh, modern porous uh, metal cups. Uh, we published it a while back. The series has built up now, but this was 18 patients treated and followed up for 48 months with the excellent results. You can put the plate and fix them along with the cemented or cementless uh, fixation. That is uh, an algorithm which is well accepted now, has been mentioned previously before. Uh, this is an example of the posterior wall combination where the additional plate can be used along with the uh, uh, hip replacement in the acute setting. And this is the follow up. The third is the cages. Now, uh, the uh, fractures in the elderly patients have, are on the rise and they very often have osteoporosis, pre-existing arthritis or complex fracture patterns. And 25% patients may die in one year and uh, almost 28% may need conversion at 2.5 years. So if they have a pre-existing arthritis, you may well head, go uh, acutely to operate on them. And uh, like it was done in this case, this was a lady severely osteoporotic, more than 80 years old, turned in the bed and had this fracture. And this kind of thing possibly is ideally suited for a Birch-Schneider case, 
we were using the ordinary uh, liner now we use a dual mobility cup in this and that's how you can actually make them stand immediately and that's a big thing in the elderly population so bar schneider cages have been used for acetabular fractures uh, primarily 20 patients reported at 73 years all were independent walkers cost would be a reason short surgery would be a reason and uh, not having long expectancy of life is a reason because these are non biological however patients with longer uh, life expectancy we have treated with these biological cages the octopus cage by dipu which is hydroxyapatite uh, coated and we published our results in journal of arthroplasty that was also a while ago Uh, you can tackle the bone defects either by using the trabecular metal augments or uh, or by using the femoral head grafts and this this is an example transverse posterior wall combination and you can see this has been demonstrated amply by the previous speaker about uh, managing the uh, the severe defect by femoral head defects you it's better to have a multi hole cup because you would like to put screws uh, as many screws as possible um another example the hps antigen positive fracture dislocation uh, we don't bother about these fracture fragments you just forget about that don't try to dissect it put a femoral head graft if required and put this uh, and this is the follow up x ray so this is the difference when you go after operation many times you lose the femoral head and then you may be forced to use um, uh, a trabecular augment uh, a metal augment rather than a femoral head graft so that's the difference we have some very special instruments like this screw driver we have which allows us to put any screw anywhere none of the screws is non accessible uh, it is actually you can see that it allows that handle to move it as a uni axial action and you also have these we have these carbide drills which allow us to drill holes into the trabecular metal shells to put the screws where we want them to be um say when the situation is like an acute pelvic discontinuity with severe comminution then we have to do a cup cage construct so there's a trabecular metal shell and we can use a cage on top of that we have been using the bar schneider cage so this is uh, how it looks again it is a poly liner but now we are using more and more dual mobility shells in that this is a follow up x ray another example of a 72 year old uh, male uh, female with uh, acute pelvic discontinuity femoral head damage and again treated with the uh, with the cup cage construct this one dislocated on post operative day 2 this is an example why they are, the uh, uh, you are at risk to malposition the components and uh, have unfavorable component orientation so uh, this could fortunately be reduced closed and then was put in a hip abduction, hip abduction brace uh, so we have published our uh, technique of cup cage constructs with porous uh, using porous cup uh, and bar schneider cage uh, uh, and it it was a short series about eight patients one had a dislocation but then it works in extreme situations the next armamentarium is a sandwich technique we have very limited uh, uh, experience in acute situation but we have managed many severe defects where we put the alternate layers of the cement or the injectable bone cement and the morselize allograft and the whole thing consolidates and provides a rock solid construct which allows immediate weight bearing and uh, uh, it has worked very well in our hands uh, so uh, heterotopic calcification and dislocation are the two major complications heterotopic calcification has been discussed this is another example of a complex uh, acetabular fracture in a 75 year old male with multiple comorbidities we did an acute cup cage this was after we published that series he came with a dislocation after a year and we found that the anterior part of the uh, cage was impinging the neck was impinging on it we just remove it with the uh, with the midas rex and he did very well and remained stable after that another group which is uh, seldom uh, addressed is the early failure so this was just uh, two weeks even the the you can see the staples were not removed and he came with the failure and we could salvage that kind of discontinuity also with the cup cage construct uh, he had recurrent dislocation which had to be changed to the constraint liner and which take took care of the problem so over the years i have changed my practice in the cup cage construct to go from the uh, um, from the zca cup to um, to the uh, to the using a 36 mm uh, trilogy uh, acetabular liner to constraint liner and now i use mostly the dual mobility shell and uh, this um, Uh, in the acute uh, acetabular fracture with the uh, acute uh, 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 acute pelvic discontinuity we have uh, 26 patient 12 we used the let's see with trilogy liner and 14 we used the dual mobility without any dislocation where we had two dislocations in this group to so conclude the modern porous um, coated cups will serve in most of the cases dual mobility cup and cages fine use in special situations fix and replace if required total hip replacement should you should have a low threshold for offering them to the elderly 
and make and you will need a lot of armamentarium as i showed and if you want to read more about it we have written this uh, review article i thank you all very much for your attention thank you so much sir and there are so many questions sir so i'll just quickly come on to the questions for you uh the first one is what is this sandwich technique so sandwich technique is essentially the alternate layers of impaction bone grafting and the injectable uh, the calcium uh, hydroxypatite uh, cement which is actually a combination of calcium sulfate and calcium hydroxypatite and it immediately sets and we have done biomechanical studies to show that it solidifies and becomes a solid construct so the difference is with an impaction grafting and cementless cup you are not able to allow them immediate unrestricted weight bearing which we are able to do with this actually this gets into in between the interstices um, uh, of the impaction grafting if any in a perfect one there should be any but we know that there are some and it actually provides the mechanical support and faster osteo integration so another question for you is what are the best types of cages in geriatric uh, age group and i would like dr sensor also to address this quickly after you so the cages are essentially non biological uh, and they fail in the long terms so they are reserved for elderly osteoporotic low demand because they are cheap and easy to do the problem is that the only uh, only uh, limited uh, type of um, uh, uh, biological cages are available octopus cage has already been withdrawn there is one by another company uh, by exactec which has got hydroxyapatite coating but by and large if you need something biological you will have to use a cup cage technique Uh, Dr. Sensor. Yeah, exactly. Dr. Rajesh has already informed about that. They, the uh, there are different cages depending upon the requirement. Mostly, the Bursnet cage was the uh, main cage which was used in many of these cases. Subsequently, basically, we are looking for what support. If these cages are supported by a adequate graft underneath them, and we are in a situation that that graft would be taken over. So there is initially a stage when the cage protects the graft. after the incorporation if that graft supports the cage the cage succeeds otherwise as professor rajesh has just told we tend to these tend to fail after fourth or fifth years inadvertently and that's the problem so that is the reason now we have gone another way that we have a trabecular metal supporting the cage on the behind and there after that some cages can work that way now uh, mez can i quickly ask you to in a very short and quick comment do you do anything differently or, or do you philosophize this uh, the cage and the uses and practice of cages differently so oh, I, i mean i use a cage uh, again for the elderly patient where i know um that the implant is probably going to um outlive the patient but i agree i think more and more um as as things progress i think we'll have different types of cages that may well give that biological support and i think if you have that then hopefully we'll be we'll be seeing these cages survive a, a bit longer but i agree i think if you've got a young patient then i don't think a cage is an option or a viable option in the long term great so very common statements from all three distinguished uh, experienced surgeons and and dr malotra said one quick question i'll combine two in one uh how do you take care of the post operative abductor dysfunction and uh, uh, what do you do uh, any special exercises you would advise patients for uh, uh, post surgical uh, uh, rehabilitation so uh, you know in acute stage the muscle wasting is not a problem so only issue is that you should not have damaged the nerve supply to the abductor muscles other than that we don't give any special uh, 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 precautions we just give them normal exercises but the issue like i said particularly when you're using cage or cup cage the issue uh, in these situations is the risk of dislocation so that's where you have to be careful about your component positioning or using something like a uh, dual mobility to keep out of trouble uh, the uh, the uh, the abductor protection is something which i don't understand there's nothing like that which is required if you're not damaged the abductor doctors and you have acutely operated they have put them to work and they'll be fine great sir so one last question for both of these talks uh, just very quick uh, answers probably uh, your definition of when you will use an mdm doc sensor dr malhotra sir yes for me because we understand these are after stabilum fracture and especially if they are after the posterior injuries it is expected that the muscle strength comes down by a layer if it is not been operated upon early as professor rajesh has said if they are operated early their muscles do not go down but in all stabilum fractures 
usually they stay go, go down from 5 to 4 once they go down to 4 and if we are a posterior surgeon operating from the same posterior side again they tend to come so the protocol in this posteriorly placed acetabulum fracture when we are doing dhr is have hip abductor starting i start around 6 week until 12th week we assess for their hip abductor which are resistive exercises and if they do those resistive exercise 6 weeks onwards till 12 weeks by at 12 weeks you tend to assess their hip abductor strength if they are okay then they are made to walk independently and so you are down to mdm as such now you have a situation when these muscles are poor they are likely to take time and in that kind of a scenario mdm saves you from that risk of dislocation in these cases okay so you will not routine you routinely advocate use no. of a uh, dual mobility for an acetabular fracture but only where you suspect that uh, the abductors would be compromised yes especially the posterior injuries in okay. anterior type injuries not really indicated sure sir so abe any case where i need to use a cage if the patient can afford i'll put in a dual mobility because that takes care of uh, any kind of malposition so that is what my take is uh, if the patient can afford all patient requiring cage will get it otherwise they'll just get a large head that's all great sir so mdm uh, uh, is not a, a panacea for cure for in all situations so moving on may i invite uh, dr rehan gol for his talk on total hip arthroplasty in comminuted trochanteric fractures rehan all yours no worries thanks a bit uh oh uh my name is rehan gol i would like to thank professor noor and the ship pacific hip society for the invite uh i'm based in ireland so i'm just going to start the presentation here and i'll just get a pointer um so Ireland I'm based in Cork which is south of Ireland works in a level 1 university hospital we deal about 500 plus hip fractures every year um about 150 to 180 periprosthetic fractures um so we all know that our our indications for total hip arthroplasty are ever expanding and as we heard very good talks from professor malotra about these complex acetabular fractures been dealt with total hip arthroplasty there's an increasing number of total arthroplasty all around the world if you look at the swedish registry it periprosthetic femoral fracture is the second most commonest cause of revision in 4 years after hip replacement so overall incidence is about 0.7 to 11 in a primary total hip arthroplasty and about 1.2 to 18% in the revision total hip arthroplasty <laughs> Duncan Clive Duncan and Marcy in 95 proposed a Vancouver classification which is very commonly used we all know about it it's a very simple system and it's very effective way of communicating so it's usually a b1 b and c b is divided into b1 b2 and b3 so we are dealing with b uh, Vancouver b today So Vancouver B1 is where the implant and the cement or uncemented implant is well fixed and it's a good bone quality. B2 is where the implants are loose either cemented or uncemented and but the bone quality is good. B3 is usually bad implant or loose implant and a bad bone quality. So that classification system has been <clears throat> integrated into a united classification system. which was a com- combined work of professor Haddad in UK and Clive Duncan so they've introduced few more things in that um burst calm shell reverse calm shell and spiral but i think overall classification remain the same it's available in the link in the paper so all the junior younger audience can look at it now just a few pictures here regarding classification so uh well fixed implants bit of a loose cement down here but overall well fixed implants and a good bone quality so b1 to b2 um again another picture which has a big lat medial wall gone but it's still a very well fixed implant with a good cement mantle all around the stem another example of b2 or b3 where there is a loosening in the cement in the proximal part but rest of the implant still very well fixed with the good bone quality and b3 would be where your cement is loose 
you have a lot of osteolysis all around the bone and the bone is so thin that even if you take everything out you your bone wouldn't support a next implant unless you go distal loading so that will be a b3 um, as per vancouver classification Moving on, uh, if you have a, a periprosthetic fracture, my go-to investigations would be a, a X-ray AP view, so we can look at the two hips. We do a lateral view as well, and we like to get a full-length femur to see if there's any other implants down below which might cause problems with reconstruction. A metal suppression CT and the 3D pictures on a metal suppression CT usually help to see the combination uh, and it'll also plan out what you want to do with that fracture. Now, treatment is based, treatment of periprosthetic fracture is based on the level of fracture. So for B1, B2, B3, you need to know where the how well fixed your implants are, where the fracture is, what kind of bone quality you're dealing with. And I think the most important for us is the comorbidity of patient because most of these patients are elderly, have multiple comorbidities, and you, you need to know what expertise you have in the department and what can you safely do to get that patient back on their feet as quickly as possible. So, I mean, very basic treatment options. Fix it if you can, replace it if your implants are loose, your cement is loose, or you have a poor bone quality. So, again, it depends on your local experience and local expertise. And for, for my younger colleagues, I think it's important to develop skill sets over time. Uh, to deal with these complex injuries. So other, I think in, in some parts of the world, availability of implants is a big issue. I know from Pakistan experience that not everything is available. Obviously, the cost of the implants is a major issue for a lot of countries. And patient health, as I mentioned already, that's the most important part and what exactly you want to achieve and how quickly you can achieve that. So that's the main thing. Um, I'm just going to go through a few examples. So that's just a B1 fracture. So cement is solid. The bone is solid. The implant is well fixed. So all we went in is to fix the fracture that allows to mobilize the patient next day, full weight bearing. Most of these fractures heal up in six weeks time. But for the patients, it takes up to three months for them to be independent or go back to where they were. So another example of a B1 fracture where the cement is well fixed, uh, but it's more comminuted fracture. And when we did a CT scan, the fracture extending right into the greater trochanter. So when we went in, uh, we decided to take out the cement. It's very easy to take out the cement because your extended trochanteric osteotomy is already done for you. Um, and we decided to replace with the distal loading implant and fix the fracture. Again, the purpose is to allow the patient to weight bear straight away. And next morning, we get up with the full weight bearing on those patients. So uncemented, while I was given all the cemented, there are uncemented implants that we are putting more and more every time. So you can look at that summit stem. It's made by Depuy. It's a proximally loading stem, a well-fixed proximally. There's a fracture across it where there is no coating on the stem. We decided to fix it because the implant is solidly fixed and it allows the patient to mobilize early. Going to B1, another example. Um, in this one, uh, it's my early days, so I should have put in more screws up here, which I didn't. But we decided to take out the stem, reduce the fracture, fix it, and do a cement on cement revision with the short exeter stem. Uh, it went on to heal, thanks God, and it's working well. But I think few screws in that plate would have helped more. So another B1 fracture, this is elderly patient who was quite sick. Uh, their cement is loose, but we decided we need to do this operation quickly and get this patient up early. And again, the full length x-ray will tell you if there's a knee implant in there or there's a stemmed prosthesis that might, be, might change your strategy. So we fixed it. Again, it's well fixed. Uh, it healed. There's no issues uh, with the mobility 
So when you go into B2, your cement is loose. Your prosthesis can be well fixed. So in this case, I think the best option is to replace it. Um, we usually like a distal loading stems to replace it. It's a modular stem. Um, we have devices to fix these fragments of trochanter that can sometimes come off when you open them up. So you can fix them very well. And most of these fractures do heal well. So again, example of an uncemented implant. So that's uh, ABG stem, I think it was done by Stryker. Uh, but you can see that's where the stem should be. So you can see even looking at an x-ray, you know it's a loose stem. It has subsided quite significantly. Um, and I don't think even if you fix them, they work. They will still be loose there and you will have a migration of the stem. So I think they need to be replaced. Depending on your expertise and availability of implant and the bone quality, uh, we have started using more and more tumor prosthesis, especially the bad quality bone, because again, uh, they, they need one operation that get them going. They're elderly patients. So sometimes we do use the tumor prosthesis as well. So that's more for a B2 and a B3. Um, again, this is, it's very hard to classify as per the Vancouver classification, but anywhere between B2 to B3, uh, this lady recently came in over Christmas for, with a very prosthetic fracture that's visible up here. Uh, this is 56 years old lady have a dysplastic hip. That's her third revision surgery that was done. So as you can see, there is a femoral head been used up here, which is well healed. Um, she's still young, so I don't think tumor prosthesis would be my uh, go-to prosthesis. So we decided to treat it with a distal loading stem, keep all the bone, bring the trochanter back again to provide us some stability. Um, hopefully that stem will be good for another 10, 15 years, and she may need another operation being a younger patient, but at least it'll get her going. Um, now, bad quality bone. So this is one of bipolar prostheses we used before. So on a significant uh, I, losing. I we can kind of try and summarize now. So right. So uh, this can be treated with a distal loading stem or a tumor prosthesis with a poor bone quality. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great talk. Lovely cases, Rehan. Just two quick questions yeah. uh, for you. What One is, what percentage of STEM should be involved for it to be unstable and with a need to be revised? For uncemented STEM, if your STEM has subsided, I don't think it's going to hold. So it definitely needs a revision. For cemented STEMs, most of them get proximally loose. Problem with those stems, even if you leave them over time, your distal part is fixed and proximal is mobile. So you can see fractures. So if your stem is loose, take them out, replace them. Uh, cement on cement is there, but problem is sometimes you see those cement. If you pressurize the cement, it will come out through the fracture site. And again, it may stop that fracture from healing. So it's a, it's a difficult one. Replacement is much easier. Your extended trochanteric osteotomy is done. All you need to do is 10, 15 minutes, take the cement out and replace with the stem. But I think it depends on what's, what expertise do you have available in your unit and what implants do you have available in the unit. So all these inventories, we have it on the shelf. If you have them, I think replacement is worth, uh, worth an option, you know. Oh, great, great. Uh, another one, a uh, quick one for you. Encirclage wires versus cables. Is there a difference in stability and which ones will you use and why? Well, cables are more stronger. I haven't seen any cables fail. Encirclage wires are, I, I think they are very good, to be honest. And I've seen a lot of people using it and they work really well. They cause less problems with the circulation or periosteal periosteum. But I think the cables for me are much more stronger and they work better for me. Thank you so much, uh, Rehan. And I'll move on. My apologies to uh, Dr. Sadak. So moving on to him, uh, total hip and comminuted trochanteric fractures by Dr. Sadak. Uh, we'll need to, un yeah. Uh, 
Marcelino, uh, you need to unmute yourself, please. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for. Can you hear me now? Sir? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, good day, everyone. I'm uh, Dr. Marcelino Tapadag, and I would like to thank Dr. Shahid Noor and the organizing committee for uh, inviting me to this webinar. So the outline of my talk, first, uh, I'll give, I will bore you with the uh, in introduction, and then I will uh, discuss some treatment principles, surgical planning, techniques, and finally, uh, some take-home message. So intertrochanteric fractures are extracapsular. Uh, it is classified as AO31A, usually resulting from high-energy injuries in the young and low-energy injuries in the elderly. The femoral head blood supply is preserved and it is usually associated with uh, mor morbidity and mortality. In the U.S., currently 280,000 hip fractures occur annually with nearly half of this due to intertrochanteric fractures, and it is estimated by, that uh, by 2040, it will increase to half a million annually. So... 31A is further divided into three uh, configurations. The 31A1 is the simple, stable intertroch fracture. 31A2 is the comminuted unstable fracture. And the 31A3 is the reverse oblique fracture. And the treatment principle, the uh, aim of treatment is to come up with a stable construct that always allow immediate weight bearing. Uh, we should also minimize the risk of implant failure or uh, more appropriately failure of fixation. We should also maximize the potential for return to pre-injury mobility for the patient. For 31A1, dynamic hip screw is the recommended treatment. And for uh, 31A2, which is our focus, uh, AO recommends either to do uh, dynamic hip screw, uh, intermedullary fixation or PFN, or arthroplasty. For 31A3, uh, either stable or unstable, PFNA is the recommended treatment. And we focus on the 31A2, the comminuted intertroch fracture, which is multifragmentary and unstable. We can either do uh, internal fixation or arthroplasty. So for internal fixation, we have two choices. Either we do sliding hip screw or cephalomedullary nail, uh, the PFN. Both have lug screw placed centrally adjacent to the apex of the head. And both have fixed angle between the femoral neck shaft and the shaft to allow controlled linear collapse. The sliding hip screw provides adequate stability, particularly with favorable fracture pattern and bone quality. Fixation is usually uh, straightforward, whereas the cephalomedral nail have relatively short liver arm between the device and fracture. It has reduced sliding distance of lug screw and can be implanted percutaneously. And uh, arthroplasty is usually uh, reserved or done in physiologically older patients, uh, usually with pre-existing hip arthritis and in patients with uh, unsatisfactory reduction in uh, older patients with poor, poor bone quality. Uh, in arthroplasty, we can do immediate weight bearing and uh, it has good long-term functional outcome. So in planning for the surgical treatment, uh, you should always consider the following, uh, the patient factors, the uh, physiologic age of the patient, the physical demand, life expectancy, bone quality, and fracture configuration. Also, the uh, equipment availability. Not all hospitals have fracture table and uh, image intensifier. And the last uh, consideration is the surgeon capability, whether you are more adept in doing arthroplasty or internal fixation. Um, 
there are numerous papers uh, comparing the outcome of uh, hip replacement and uh, internal fixation in uh, intertrochanteric fractures. This uh, paper concludes that hip replacement has more advantages than PFNA in the treatment of uh, senile intertrochanteric fractures. Another paper concludes that there's a uh, arthroplasty provides superior functional outcomes, especially earlier mobilization as compared to internal fixation in elderly with unstable intertroph uh, femoral fractures. Another paper in specific group of uh, unstable intertroph fractures, arthroplasty might be the best operative technique in terms of uh, lower operative failure and reoperation and highest uh, highest hip score during short and intermediate uh, period compared to PFNS and DHS. So uh, now that you are uh, planning to do arthroplasty, the next question is whether to do hemiarthroplasty or totally arthroplasty. And uh, the following are the considerations, the uh, pre-existing hip arthritis, the physical demand and life expectancy of the patient, and of course, uh, surgeon capability. If you are a high output uh, surgeon, you may also consider doing totally arthroplasty. Uh, there are, again, numerous papers in uh, comparing the outcome between the hemiarthroplasty and total hip arthroplasty, but are mostly limited to femoral neck fractures, like this paper uh, that concluded THA has better medium uh, functional results and quality of life and lower acetabular erosion rate, whereas hemiarthroplasty has reduced our hospital stay surgery time, blood loss, and dislocation rate. Another paper for healthier elderly patients with displaced femoral neck fractures, treatment with hemiarthroplasty led to better outcomes regarding dislocation rate, while THA was better regarding acetabular erosion and reoperation rate. So similar results. And in patients more than 65 who underwent THA for hip fractures had... Uh, reduce short-term mortality risk. So we go now to the techniques to do uh, arthroplasty on in uh, uh, commutated intertroch fractures. The first technique uh, that we can employ is the cartilage replacing arthroplasty. And uh, we must at always, it is imperative to uh, fix the greater trochanter to the femoral shaft and the lesser trochanter may or may not be reattached. Um, the calca replacing stem uh, uh, is available in two sizes, and the size to be used is dependent on the level of the fracture on the, the letter, lesser trochanter. The uh, next technique is the calca retaining arthroplasty. Uh, it is also called the proximal fragment retaining arthroplasty. Um, to do this, uh, osteotomy is done at the level of the femoral neck and the uh, proximal fragment is retained instead of uh, discarding it. So during the preparation of the femoral canal, the proximal fragment is reduced and aligned to the distal fragment in a shish kebab manner, like so. And then um, we can either do cemented or cementless fixation of the femoral prosthesis to the uh, canal. And uh, the lesser trochanter may be reattached using circlage wires. Alternatively, they can be left uh, untouched. So for my uh, take-home message, you should always uh, know your patient, their uh, physiologic age, uh, physical demand, life expectancy, bone quality, fracture configuration, even the financial capacity of the patient. You should also know yourself, your skills, and your uh, preference, and uh, know your implements, the availability of equipment in your hospital, and uh, uh, the most important is uh, always aim for a stable contract that, uh, construct that allows immediate uh, weight bearing. 
Uh, with that, I would like to thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Sadag. Excellent talk on a very difficult topic. Uh, I have a quick question before I take a final word from you, uh, which I will request uh, Professor Noor and then Mez to take a call on it. So what is that one clinching factor where you will say ORIF? And what is that one clinching factor which will make you say arthroplasty? Professor Noor, sir. Um, in most cases, in primary intertrochanterial fracture, my preference will be osteosynthesis. Uh, so, um, and very elderly um, and very comminuted fracture where you don't think that it's going to heal, we go for arthroplasty. Right. Uh, Mez, uh, anything to add on this? Any yeah, guidelines, so, uh, any criteria which make you decide? No, I think um, uh, sometimes, uh, for, for me, I usually fix them as well. But I think where you have those difficult fractures, where you have an intracapsular element to them with the extracapsular comminution, I think with those and the elderly, um, fixing them has a higher chance of failure. And some people may not allow them to wait there. So I think for those particular cases, which is a small um, uh, amount of cases, I think an arthroplasty is possibly an option. Yeah. But it's a, it's a complex primary arthroplasty, as we know. Great. So uh, another very quick question before I move on to our president's uh, talk is that uh, between plates and uh, uh, trochanteric plates and wiring techniques, uh, uh, do you have a specific technique which will help you on this. So I would like uh, Dr. Malhotra sir to opine on this and then a quick word from uh, Drehan on this. So there's no wiring technique like Chanle wiring technique. So that's uh, possibly a uh, great art. And uh, uh, um, the, uh, the plates are, um, uh, are expensive. So we rely on the wires and a good wiring technique, like uh, you said rightly, uh, is the key to having the trochanter stay where you want it to be. Uh, the, the problem with trochanter is there's so much force in that trochanter that it'll pull out any wiring system. So you need a claw to hold it down. Even sometimes you see the claws, the trochanter slipping under the claws to come out. So there's no easy way out. But if you're bringing the trochanters down and attaching it, I think the claw and cables are more stronger construct. My own experience with cables is very limited, but anytime we've used it, they either break and coming from a Chanle's country, we did saw a lot of cable cabling techniques. Even I did it in my training, those cables around Rokenter, but they all broke if there is a non-union. So it's a race between the fracture or the trochanteric union and the metal failure. So I think the cables are more stronger. Those hook plates are nice. They bring bring the whole trochanter back. So I think it's worth considering those options when you're doing those complex cases. As a final word, Dr. Sadak, would you like to give a, a, an additional message on the two questions or I think uh, or enough has been covered? Uh, 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 for the, for the uh, whether to do arthroplasty or internal fixation, uh, my, my final consideration is the uh, quality of the bone stock. If uh, I think the internal fixation will, uh, will uh, fail, and I, I don't want to subject the patient to the risk of a reoperation. So I do uh, arthroplasty right away. Uh, uh, that's it. For Excellent me. points uh, from all faculty, basically highlighting that it's the quality of bone stock, the potential instability of the fracture, and uh, the purported uh, uh, the, uh, degree of preambulatory status and uh, the expected uh, morbidity and mortality of the procedure considering an elderly patient's physiology. So all these basically go in to make you decide which one will you choose for an arthroplasty and which one for an internal fixation. So moving on to our president and uh, a very, very uh, illuminated and decorated uh, revision arthroplasty surgeon, uh, may I request and invite uh, Professor Shahid Noor for his talk on subtrochanteric non-unions and, and choosing stems uh, in total arthroplasty. Uh, thank you very much, Abbe. Um, a very excellent uh, presentation by my previous speaker. 
osteoporosis and fragility fracture are on their rise universally. I was trained in UK, came back uh, to Pakistan in 1998, working there for eight years in many hospital teaching and district general hospital. For eight years, I did not find any hospital that would be investigating osteoporosis by doing a bone density or treating osteoporosis, whether it be spine fracture or a hip fracture or ankle fracture, we were fixing. So things have moved rapidly when I came back to Pakistan. Uh, stone throwing distance from my house, there was a DEXA scan available and there was more awareness. Uh, but uh, International Osteoporosis Foundation has uh, given uh, awareness of osteoporosis and we being surgeon, I think prevention and identifying osteopenia and osteoporosis is very important to prevent these complex fractures. Subtrochantric region of femur are notorious for non-union. And situation get very difficult and challenging when multiple surgeries and bone grafting have already been done. Options of treatment in such condition are management are re-osteosynthesis or salvage hip arthroplasty. I'm today going to talk more of uh, hip arthroplasty, giving one option, reliable option, and mobilize the patient full weight bearing and improving quality of life. Uh, Preoperative assessment is obviously, and planning is mandatory. Exclusion of infection by non-invasive and invasive uh, investigation are mandatory. Metabolic workup for to assess vitamin D and osteoporosis is essential. Uh, a good quality x-ray is mandatory, including pelvic x-ray and full length femur x-ray to see the good quality bone available for uh, implant fixation. Assess and classify bone loss and then plan your reconstructive option. In most of the cases of subtrochantric fracture non-union, according to Paprosky, this will fall into 3A or 3B type of bone defect. So choices of implant in reconstruction Primary femoral component is not going to work in these situations. Femoral stem has to be a diaphyseal fixation-based implant. Stem could be cemented or uncemented. Cemented stem will require impaction bone grafting and cage and cable. Uncemented stem could be either tapered fluted, fully porous coated, or etche coated. And stem could be either modular or non-modular. And a stem, uncemented stem, could have either dist options of distal locking screw. And finally, in extreme cases, proximal femoral replacement works very well and give predictable result. My choice of implant, choice of femoral component depend on your experience, also availability and affordability. So whatever is available, where you have been trained and what the patient can afford. My workhorse in subtrochantric non-union requiring hip arthroplasty is a modular tapered fluted stem. It works in most cases. This provide flexibility, uh, absolute, uh, it gives stability in the diaphysis. Uh, it helps in managing leg length and also help the modularity help in restoring the femoral antiversion. I routinely use dual mobility socket in all such cases as rate of dislocation are high in these complex cases and even further reducing one complication which is dislocation i use it routinely both in a cemented situation as well as uncemented reconstruction in extreme cases i don't hesitate using proximal femoral replacement i'm just going to show a few cases uh, this is a patient who has been uh, a basic cervical fracture operated outside pakistan and unfortunately, it was infected, so she had removal of implant. So this is how she presented with high writing femur. We did investigation for infection, which was luckily negative. So these are intraoperative pictures. Uh, and we use a modular Wagner type of implant, a primary cemented cup. These are intraoperative pictures and postoperative x-rays. And the patient was mobilized full weight bearing. Another case, a simple intertrochantric fracture. This was managed with the dynamic hip screw, uh, failure of implant with migration. And this was managed by primary surgeon with bone grafting and uh, proximal femur locking uh, play. Uh, by the time she uh, he came to my uh, assessment, there was a 
femoral head avian and collapse and implant failure. So we opted for removal of implant, uh, preoperative investigation for infection, a primary cemented uh, uh, femoral socket, and again, uh, fluted Wagner uh, stem. These are improper pictures and postoperative x-rays. Patient mobilized full weight during his five years down the line and doing pretty good. Another case, a young 28 years old male patient has had a fixed blade plate fixation for some pathology where reports were not available. And 10 years ago, uh, he came to our service with increasing pain and limping gait. So we removed the implant, did cultures and biopsy. Cultures were negative and biopsy was uh, a benign uh, tissue. So we opted for femoral reconstruction, uh, hip arthroplasty. The, and so we use a monoblock uh, Wagner fluted stem. And at that time in 2010, resurfacing was the, and metal metal was the best bearing surface, which was recommended in young patient as well. So we use a resurfacing socket uh, and these are intraoperative pictures. And the reconstruction was done with the help of a posterior ilicris graft and fibular autogenous graft. So these are intraoperative pictures where block of posterior ilicris graft have been used and uh, autogenous fibula and good wiring technique. These are postoperative x-rays. This is two years down the line and still he is doing pretty good. This patient uh, came from Kenya. Uh, has had bilateral internal fixation of subtrochanteric fracture uh, with fixed plate plate and implant failure. Uh, she was more symptomatic initially on the right side. Initial workup for infections were negative. So uh, we offered a total hip arthroplasty with a dual mobility cup as a routine and again modular Wagner implant. These are intraoperative pictures and uh, bone grafting and fixation, these are postoperative x-rays. And similar procedure was done on the left hip and she is three years down the line and doing pretty good. This is the last case and a master of all case. Uh, this patient in 2010, when she was 50 years old, had a subtrochanteric fracture and this was managed in a different city with the interlocking nail. Um, one year down the line, she had uh, implant failure. So this was revised with a gamma nail with locking distally. Unfortunately, one year down the line, she had implant failure. She continued to have subtrochanteric non-union. Uh, so the gamma nail was removed, bone grafting, and DCS was performed. Unfortunately, she had... Uh, continue to have subtrochanteric non-union, uh, failure of DCS implant. So bone grafting and revised DCS was done and you can see distally uh, broken screws and overlapping screw. Unfortunately, again, this did not work. And this is how she presented six year down the line. Uh, having six years ago, she had had her primary fixation. Uh, obviously, she was uh, 100 kilos and diabetic and osteoporotic, which was managed. Uh, so I said it's a very difficult case and wanted to exclude infection uh, and explain that there is no further chances of osteosynthesis. At the head is a, a shell. Uh, I would exclude infection and offer her, her a hip arthroplasty. So these are intraoperative pictures where metal were, were removed, cultures were taken, uh, did a dual mobility shell on the acetabular side and did a proximal femur replacement. These are intraoperative pictures and these are postoperative pictures and the patient was mobilized full weight bearing. So in conclusion, subtrochanteric non-union non are notorious for failure. Total hip arthroplasty using correct surgical technique, correct choice of implant can predictably transform quality of life of patient. This procedure should be performed by experienced arthroplasty surgeon to avoid added misery to the patient.
Revision surgeries are difficult, and the rate of complications of revision surgery universally are much worse than primary surgery. So this is the take home message that, uh, and uh, I'm open to any questions and queries and comments. Thank you so much, sir, for a fantastic talk. Uh, and uh, while people are uh, uh, putting their questions across, uh, I have a question for you. So uh, do you have a, a kind of an algorithm as to how you will choose a particular stem into in a, in a given situation? And uh, what uh, would be your go-to stem in a given scenario, okay. especially in the trauma conversions? Yeah, since so trauma conversion, uh, obviously, exclude infection. Look at what is what good bone is available. Obviously, in subtrochantric non-union, diaphyseal bone are available in most cases. So it's type three A. Uh, Rarely it is th type 3B and 4 where situation is going to be changed. So up till 3A, you have good 4 centimeter of diaphyseal bone where fluted stem will provide immediate stability, rotational as well as axial stability. So that's my first workhorse. Obviously, on the acetabular side, most of the time, the bone loss is not there. So you can use a primary socket. And then second step is diaphyseal fixation with a fluted stem. And then you have a modularity and you can check correct diversion. And finally, restore the abductor mechanism. Uh, Prius system from a French company, uh, Evolutus, also provide a trochanteric grip plate, which can be screwed into the implant. And I find it very effective, uh, very reliable um, thing. So. Uh, to conclude, diaphyseal fixation with fluted stem is my workhorse. Obviously, um, in multiple surgeries, uh, as in the last case, uh, I did not, and the patient was 100 kilos, so I wanted to give her uh, a reliable surgery, so I, I offered her a proximal femur replacement. Okay, so uh, another question which I wish to allude to you is that what would be your, and I would like David and Dr. Sensor also to come on in this, uh, what would be your indication to do an impaction bone grafting in uh, especially a, a, a subtrochantric non-union situation? And would the type of non-union have any bearing on the kind of fixation that you would use? Uh, Abhi, this is all skill dependent. Uh, and if you go to any a uh, big uh, uh, meeting whether the American Academy or an effort because this is not industry driven. So this is a dying skill. So it's uh, cementing technique is a skill. You do perfectly your result in a primary uh, femoral component is going to be as good as any uncemented implant. So uh, I'm not trained to do impaction bone grafting. I don't have the cage available for proximal uh, femur, but I think uh, from the platform of Asia Pacific for uh, countries like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and other where um, there are low socioeconomic, so this skill need to be revived. Impaction bone grafting and availability of different cage, and you don't need to use a cable, and you can use a circulage wire. Um, establish a good bank, good bone bank have the availability of double tapered polished stem to impaction bone grafting. Look at the result of Exeter. They, they do a majority of their revision femur and the acetabulum with impaction bone grafting and cage. David, uh, would you like to comment on this? What is your experience regarding impaction bone grafting? Well, as, you know, I mean, as you know, my personal preference is for polished tapered stem that's cemented with impaction grafting. Certainly, if you have a non uh, subtrochanteric non-union, um, the results of that are not good even with these kind of implants. And actually, you need to provide stability across the non-union before you can even hope to succeed. So what you would do here is that I would now put a uh, trochanteric plate and span it all the way down to at least you know a good... Uh, uh, six inches uh, below the tip of the stem. And that is simply a, a sort of bridge fixation to avoid uh, stress loading 
at the non-union side and to avoid rotatory problems. No matter what implant you put in, when you have a subtrochanteric non-union, you have rotatory instability and you need to solve the rotatory instability. Otherwise, you're simply going to get a recurrent non-union no matter what you do. Great, great point, sir. Dr. Sain, sir, quick reply from you before we go to Mez because he's on call and he's already got a call from theatre. So just to say that we need, if there is a bone defect around that area of a non-union, circulage, uh, mesh along with the circulage wire can cover it up and then we do have those tools to impact the mesh in the graft into that area and then to put up a cemented stem as such. But as Dr. David said it, if there is a, usually there is a proximal loosening and the proximal fragment does not fit very well. So in that case of kind of a supportive plate is required. Sure, sir. Uh, may I now move on to the next talk, which is Dr. Mehul Acharya, Mr. Mehul Acharya, and he will be talking on management of abductor dysfunction uh, in the conversion total hip arthroplasty. May it's all yours. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Noor. Thank you, Dr. Abey. Thank you very much for the invite. Um, it's great to be here uh, with everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about abductor dysfunction and how we manage that. Um, and so if you look at greater trochanteric pain syndrome, it affects 25%, up to 25% of the population. Abductor deficiency is a well-recognized cause of hip pain and limping following total hip replacement or, to, or following fractures. If we look at hip replacement, abductor deficiency um, can be present in up to about 22%. It's interesting that up to about 20% of, of patients may well be asymptomatic. Um, females are more often uh, likely to have tears than males. If we look at surgical approaches, so if you've used the uh, lateral or the antralateral type approach, uh, there's up to a 20% um, risk of, of uh, abductor de uh, deficiency. If we look at the posterior approach where you think, well, actually, you're leaving the abductors and you're not touching them. Actually, there are reports to show that uh, up to 16 percent of this group of patients may well have abductor weakness or deficiency as well. So when I when I look at these patients, there are a host of things I, I do and get. So I look at their gait. Um, I'll look at their leg length, um, uh, assess their Trendelenburg gait and test. And then look at the, the x-rays. So I want to look at the orientation of the implants, the leg length, the offset, uh, the quality of bone, etc. And then I'll get some adjuvant imaging. So I'll get an ultrasound scan. Um, uh, you can get arthrograms. I don't usually tend to get them. Um, but I, the MRI scan is a very useful investigation. And there are various different surgical techniques that you can, you can do to try and reconstruct or repair the abductors. And, and part of the, the armamentarium depends on when um, that injury has occurred or when that detachment has occurred. If it's early, you may be able to get some direct repair. But if it's later on or if it's chronic, then you need to think about something else. And what, I'll, what I tend to do for some of these late chronic um, uh, abductor deficiencies is think about a glute max transfer uh, and a Lars ligament reconstruction. So um, what's the evidence behind it? Well, if we look at uh, this paper in uh, 2014 from Hepo International, 22 patients with a Lars ligament reconstruction, um, all patients had an improvement um, in their Oxford hip score uh, at 12 months. If we look at these um, uh, patients who had a glute max transfer, so 11 patients, nine of these had a strong abductor muscle strength postoperatively. So I'm going to illustrate this through a case. So this is a 71-year-old lady. She had a right total hip replacement, uh, a Birmingham uh, anthology hip in 2008. She had some pain in her hip a year following that replacement. She was regularly reviewed by the surgeon who did the initial procedure and said everything's fine. And then she went um, uh, to go and see a colleague of mine um, and had a second opinion. And this was her initial x-ray. So you see she's got some spine metal work. You see she's got a, a large stemmed metal, metal hip replacement. But look at that. Look at the area of the great trochanter. This is her lateral. So you can see the stem is a little front to back. It's a bit of lysis in the posterior column. 
Because she has a Mars MRI scan. And what this shows is that uh, there's a large collection involving the abductors um, uh, and the vastus lateralis, so a pseudotumor. And she's got some uh, lysis in zone one and zone two around the cup as well. There's erosion and destruction of the great trochanter. Uh, her metal ions were both up, cobalt and chromium. White cells were normal. CRP was um, high 20s. So I aspirated. Um, well, she was aspirated actually in, in, in the initial unit, and it didn't show any evidence of infection. So she went to a different unit and had a first revision. So this revision was in May 2018. She had excision of the pseudotumor, had the revision of the Birmingham hip, to a uh, lima dual mobility uh, and a bio ball for the uh, uh, um, uh, for the stem and the taper. She had her abductors repaired at the time. Unfortunately, this failed within a couple of months. So she had a dislocated dual mobility um, with a dissociation of the polyliner. So this was then subsequently revised again um, to uh, uh, the revision of the modular components of the lima. This is her again. So she dislocates that modular liner once more. So this is 25th of October now. She's already had two revisions. But they managed to get it back closed, or do they? So look here, we see that actually the head has been reduced into the socket, but the polyliner has been left behind here, okay? So then she came to me and my plan here was to consider revising the hip, needed revising, further excision of the pseudotumor, to revise the cup to a constrained cup, to improve the offset, to reconstruct the abductors and to augment the reconstruction. I'll just talk you through that plan um, and some images to show how I do this. So this is um, quite a nice way of augmenting your reconstruction with the um, glute max transfer. And you see the picture on the top right um, on how this is fashioned initially. And you see this is, these are some intraoperative pictures where I've marked out my beaked flap of my glute max. And I've uh, created it here, bottom left. You see the polycup was dislocated when I went in there and still some evidence of that pseudotumor. So pseudotumor has been excised. My glute max transfer has been lifted up here. You see that uh, uh, the ceramic uh, head is lying in that ceramic socket. You see that, I'll just go back, that there's significant um, detachment of the abductors here. So this is a right hip, significant detachment of the abductors. So I revised uh, the socket, um, um, put a new head on, further radical debridement, and you see the abductor deficiency that I was alluding to here at the front. So what I did with that is I used Lars ligament, and it's the tumor band, and I, I put it on the undersurface with ethyl bond onto the um, abductors. I then create various tunnels uh, through the great trochanter or the remains of the great trochanter. So this is the oblique tunnel. And this is the transverse band. And you see I've reconstructed those two bands there. I then tension the graft with the interference screw and then overlap the, um, uh, the tumor band or the last ligament uh, on itself again. And you can see now I'm bringing down the uh, glute max transfer to give that more proximal and superior um, reconstruction as well. And that's what it looks like in the end. So that's my reconstruction of the abductors and a glute max transfer. And there you see I've closed the, the fascia and there are her post-op x-rays. That's her immediate post-op. And then that's her two years post-op. So she comes back for her other hip as well. So in summary, you know, um, abductor deficiency, abductor de detachment is a difficult problem to deal with. It's debilitating. Um, the chronic, complete, retracted tears are really difficult, and I'm pretty aggressive with them. So I will use Lars ligament reconstruction um, augmented with a glute max transfer. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Uh, I think we've come to the 
end of the uh, the talks and some wonderful discussions uh, not much on the chat box in terms of questions so i have a question for you in case uh, you have a recurrent dislocation uh, what would be your go to abductor muscle uh, uh, procedure uh, abductor muscle reconstruction procedure and i would like request uh, professor malhotra sir to come in on this as well so we first abhay or yeah you first and then who will the first <laughs> very good so um yes yeah, so if they've had a recurrent dislocation then i would get um the imaging so i'd get an ultrasound scan and an mri scan um to look at whether the abductors were detached so on uh, available i would have a constrained cup um from um uh, an armamentarium point of view i would certainly have the uh, tumor band the lars ligament and i would um so now my go to is a lars ligament reconstruction augmented with a glute max transfer and that's what i do so so abe i have about experience of 10 cases of uh, the uh, glute max transfer we we don't use lars ligament it's expensive and uh, i'm not even sure whether it's available the only thing i do differently is that we split the uh, vastus lateralis and bury the attachment of gluteus maximus underneath to transversal sutures and close that v in the uh, vastus lateralis on top of it moreover we can actually we very not can we often use the uh, iliotibial band which has been described by white side to work as a gluteus minimus so we take a part of that and bring it on and attach it and i'll tell you something very interesting i have a very vast experience of proximal femoral allografts and when we bring the gluteus maximus and the uh, tensor fascia lata over to the greater trochanter of the uh, of the allograft and just uh, they tag them there with some sutures i have not had a single dislocation of a proximal femoral allograft either with the dual mobility or with a large head or with any kind of head and i agree with mess i would put a constrained liner if there is no abductor but i am if i'm just augmenting i would prefer if possible to put in a dual mobility but then uh, uh, that's again depending on the situation which we find there thank you thank you very much uh, professor shahid sir for your comments before we move on to the uh, to the panel discussion uh, thank you very much abe and moderating this session i would say it has been wonderful to listen to such a galaxy of uh, very very experienced surgeon and it was not just a theory so we had the literature plus the personal experience uh, from david from andy to rameshan a uh, wonderful presentation by uh, rajesh malhotra and marcelino uh, rehan uh, showed the wonderful cases of uh, periprostatic fracture and mes uh, showed a, a very nice uh, technique and i would definitely like to learn or one of my team to learn this technique in dealing with difficult situation so we come to a uh, conclusion of series of lecture i would request abe to start some case discussion where all faculty will be involved and we will take um, opinion from uh, each faculty so all to you abe so the first case uh, and we've changed the order a bit uh, for our gourmet lunch Uh, is uh, from uh, Mehul. So, may as your case, please, and you can actually just in, in, in start off by uh, by asking uh, opinions from faculty yourself. Uh, yeah, that's great. Thanks, Abey. So, um, thanks for changing the order. So, this is an 86-year-old female, pretty independent, walks five miles a day. She had a fall from a standing height, um, and she presents with this displaced acetabular fracture. So, yeah, open it up to the to the floor then. So. um what would people do so um let's go to uh, david 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 chun what would you do uh thanks i, I think um she's all she needs to get one operation and get back on her feet as soon as possible she's actually quite good pre uh, pre morbid so what i would do is i put a cage on this that's the only way out of it you have a femoral head there's got a lot of bone there for impaction grafting um i I don't there is a certain amount of instability to this fracture so I don't think that you can get away with simply putting a mesh 
on to this, although I have done this before in the past and got away with it. I don't think that's going to work here. So you need a gap too, which is my, my go-to implant for this. And in order to get that on properly, you really need to do a transtocontaric approach to this. Really, she's got a very good trochanter. It's going to heal back very well. Uh, and it's very easy for you to view and to put on your, your GAP2. GAP2 really needs a lot of uh, exposure of the acetabulum. And you really need to try and get the abductors out of the way. Otherwise, those uh, uh, superior uh, lungs don't actually fit on well. Uh, and I would impression graph and I do a, a cemented implant. Thank you. Okay. Um any other views, Professor Malhotra? Yeah, I agree. I would just forget about the fracture. Remove the head, impaction, uh, uh, grafting of the uh, the defect, put in a cage, and preferably put in a dual mobility socket in that and any stem on the other side. Great. Can we go on? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, let's go on and just see some CT cuts then. So CT cuts show the fracture goes, um, yep, uh, quite a high way up. Um, you see that there's significant impaction, as we've said, etc. Um, I'll make some more CT scans on the ne next cut. So again, you see that whole of the the socket has essentially been uh, exploded. It's blown apart. Okay, so we've talked about options, um, and you're right. You know that that's something which I would have which I would have done um, a few years ago. But what I'm going to do is just show you um, a little bit. To, uh, well, a few few images about what we tend to do for some of these fractures now. So my plan um, was to put her in the lateral position. Um, we have these uh, suction bags or bean bags, which make imaging um, really very easy of the whole pelvis and acetabulum. Um, and I was going to do a cocker Langerbeck approach. I was going to plate the posterior column because of that marked displacement. And then I, I uh, chose to do a code hemipelvis for this patient. So I'll just run through some images on how I do that. So, so there we see we've got the exposure of the hip socket. And you see I put that um, initial guide wire under image up that um, um, just proximal, just or just above the level of the greater notch heading back to the PSIS. And then I've prepared that corridor of bone. Um, sequentially with a rema, um, and then I've uh, trialed a, a modular cone hemiprosthesis uh, once I've plated the posterior column to reconstruct that posterior column. And there you see some images with the, uh, with the trial um, cone hemipelvis in, in situ, and then the actual cone hemipelvis, which is uh, cemented and a trial stem. So uh, Abe, we'll just move on to the next slide. Yeah, yeah. So the reason why we moved um, to this is, is uh, I agree. So we want the patient to fully weight bear, and a lot of the time, um, if you if you do a single approach, you may not be able to allow the patient to weight bear. So what we did is we started moving towards dual approaches. So fixing the anterior column, fixing the posterior column, and then putting a, uh, a revision type shell. But that's quite a big operation for these 80, 90 year olds. And so this particular procedure allows a single operation, um, which allows them to weight bear. And we've done about um, uh, 18 to 20 of these now. Um, we allow them fully weight bearing immediately post-op. And then I bet you'll see some uh, um, images on the next slide as well, which just shows that actually three months post-op, you can already see that the acetabular fracture is starting to knit. Um, and, you know, she's doing very, very well. So just comments and thoughts uh, about this. Can I request Andito to come on this, please? Great procedure, great result. Uh, would uh, Andito, you have done something differently and what would your approach have been? Yeah, for me, we, I do, we'll do a impacted bone graph, uh, put some cages and then, uh, yeah, primary uh, uh, do a uh, dual mobility cup with cemented. So may I request the faculty if, if uh, anyone else uh, has the experience of using a cone and what would their thoughts be on this? Abe, can I, can I put it? Yes, in? sir. Sure, sir. Yeah, please. Uh, I have a question to Mehul. We have these cones with us. The problem is if it is a low ABC fracture of a stabulum, you get a reasonable amount of a strut in the back. 
But if it is a spur kind of a situation, which is a high ABC kind of a fracture, then the spur doesn't give you a very good area to get in. So what are the, what is the trick of getting into that narrow area? Yeah. So so you're right. So with uh, with you, so this uh, prosthesis was mainly used for tumors, uh-huh. and and yes, what yes. you need is 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 you need a a column of bone about five centimeters. Um, in in that ileum heading towards the PSIS. So as long as you've got that, then this this should work. But I but I, but I agree. I think with the high ABCs, you may need to augment your fixation. So you may need to put a little uh, plate on um, to bring that column of bone down. But uh, but all you need in that um, um, in that ileum is about five centimeters. And if you've got that, this should work. Yes, this that that was the difficulty we had in putting in that part of it. So there is a question in the chat box, uh, Mez. Uh, what is the uh, advantage of using a cumbersome cone prosthesis? <laughs> yeah, so the, uh, so for me, uh, the the advantage is is that you're getting so for some of these really comminuted fractures, you're getting fixation in in good bone or native bone, I should say. And you're not relying on um, uh, allograft or autograft. So th- those are the two main advantages for me. And I can allow them to fully wait bear straight away. Great. So uh, any other comments from faculty on what they would have done differently or what philosophy they would have followed? Dr. Sensa, uh, Dr. Sadak, uh, David? Yeah, I would like to give a comment as well. Abhi, uh, Dr. Noor, uh, I think uh, same issue, same uh, pathology can be managed in different ways. So in North America, people will be doing it in a different way. In Europe, in the UK, they'll be doing it in a different way. But we have to look what we will be doing in India and Pakistan and Bangladesh. And what is routinely available. For example, I'll give you an entirely different scenario. Uh, OA of the advanced OA of the knee and uh, comminuted distal femur fracture. So distal femur implant are freely available. It's a 30-minute job. You open it up and, and cut the distal femur and put an implant and full weight bearing. So no added thing. But if you have to do a multiple procedure, uh, no disrespect to you, sir, uh, uh, Mahul, uh, but you have to do a two-column and then, uh, 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 and for, for example, a young surgeon who's had no experience of uh, doing this procedure a difficult procedure so yes an expert hand yes but what is routine in asia pacific region especially uh, a developing country i would go for conventional which is uh, uh, you have a good head available you have a birch largest cage is available everywhere and it's uh, rajesh will agree with me it's not very expensive it's freely available uh, it's different sizes are available and uh, but yes, very nicely done. But uh, routinely uh, uh, in my center, I never do pelvic. Uh, uh, we have a dedicated consultant who does pelvic and acetabulum, and I don't touch. So I have no experience. Um, There's well, a full think- version of this procedure. Yes. What you would do here is what Peter Chung has done in the past. For some of his uh, terrible tumors, we completely resect out the entire acetabulum. All he does is he puts some diamond pins in, and then he reconstructs the whole things around around cement at the ends of this diamond pin and some metal. And somehow or other, they seem to hold together. Yeah, I've I've done that as well. I've done uh, you know I do a lot of tumors. You're right, and so I'll put the Harrington rods in um, and reconstruct around. Then all I'm saying is that actually we you know we we're trying to push the boundaries with these patients. And we've got to have, um, we've just got to be open to um, what's in our armamentarium and trying to trying to better ourselves. Um, and yes, there are different ways of doing things and different things that work from a logistic point of view, um, from a kit point of view, from a finance point of view. But, you know, we as surgeons, we need to think about the next step and the next innovation and, and trying to improve those outcomes. We've seen from, from all of these um, talks and the literature that actually the outcomes are good. Um, but if we can try and improve these outcomes for these patients, that's where we should be heading. Great. Man, just the latest iPhone, friend. 
So great points, faculty. I think to just to summarize and quickly close the discussion on this case, we got to move on forward. These are elderly patients need to get back on their feet very well. You need to reconstruct uh, the columns in a way, and then uh, depends on the experience and expertise and the uh, availability of tools in the uh, in your surgical practice. If it's something that uh, one is not uh, used to doing. I think a very good message uh, from this platform will be to refer the patient to uh, someone who has the experience to do them. So would that be a fair thing to say before we move on, uh, Mess? Very good. And a special thanks to Mess. I really like your abductor mechanism reconstruction. Wonderful technique. Uh, sometime when I'm visiting the UK, I would come and <laughs> pop in to your OR. Good. Thank you so Thank much, you. sir. So moving on to the next case, and I would request uh, uh, Dr. Sen, sir, to come on this. Uh, 85 years old male had a staged bilateral total knee done in 2014, sustained a slip and fall at home, a trivial trauma, a fragility fracture, and uh, had a, a small history in which said he had a deteriorating Parkinson's disease. So we chose to, to treat the primary uh, injury. I'm sorry, I don't have those images here. So it was an undisplaced ABC fracture, low and uh, low ABC, which we chose to uh, uh, chose to conserve. But four months down the line, this gentleman came back with this. So quick take on what you would do here, sir. Considering that this is a fracture, where one important thing uh, which I tend to see that the how is the posterior superior area which has to bear the weight. Here the external uh, support is already there. Mm -hmm. We have got a bone loss, so taking out the head making it a good kind of a mesh if there is a defect might put that mesh in that area otherwise impaction grafting and then putting a cup would be my choice and looking at the kind of a support available if i'm able to get a uncemented dual mobility cup that will be better if i don't get it then it could be a cemented dual mobility cup that will be my option considering he is a parkinsonism situation in that scenario Thank you, sir. Great points. Uh, Rehan, can I get you on this? How does Parkinson's change the way you are thinking about this particular situation? Not really. I think aligning your components is the best thing. We do talk about dual mobility, but I think our experience with dual mobility, they can dislocate if your components are not in the right place. So even constrained liners, I have few constrained liners which have dislocated because abductors are not right or the component positioning was not right. So I think if you line up your components well, yes, dual mobility will give you extra bit of a benefit, but I wouldn't change. I'll do a standard primary hip replacement, bone graft the medial wall and put few screws into the roof and maybe into the posterior column. So what bearing couple will you choose here, Ryan? I usually go with a 36 head, old. which is my go-to at the moment. I sometimes use a lip liner, which gives me a 10 degrees of lip. And you can rotate that liner where if you're anterior lateral approach, then bring that wall anteriorly. So you get more cover for that hip in the front. If you're a posterior approacher, leave that 10 degree wall in the posterior one, which is the face changers, face changing option. Great. So my question to Dr. Malhotra, sir, sir, uh, what would there be a situation where you would choose between when you would do a dual mobility versus when you would do a constraint cemented? Yeah. So if the uh, if uh, the components are in a good position, uh, I would like to put in a constraint liner, particularly if the abductors are not good. So poor soft tissue tension reasonable uh, component orientation i'll use a constraint liner if the if the components are a bit off in terms of optimal position uh, but the soft tissues are not very lax i would use a dual mobility uh, and i would just like to say away uh, in these kinds of cases even if there is say discontinuity i can get away by wedging a cup uh, between that anterior superior and posterior inferior part the only condition is that I should be able to get this kickstand screws in the pubis uh, as well as ischium preferably or at least in one of those two bones. And that's where I showed you that special screwdriver that we use. Uh, if we can get screws on the top as well as down below, it's possible to treat even the acute or chronic discontinuity also with a good porous cup without going for cage or something really very uh, big. Very, very important. I'd just like to add something to say 
yeah, actually David. that for people not really very okay with this kind of surgery, I would not try to dislocate that hip. I would you certainly do a, 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 a basal neck osteotomy and then just remove the hip piecemeal. Because if you try to um, actually dislocate it, you'd end up with all kinds of problems. Very important point, uh, David. Uh, just thanks, sir. While just clarifying another point, uh, you mentioned something extremely important that uh, if we the component alignment is very, very important, and that's a message, very important message for the audience. If you have good anterior superior and posterior inferior hold, then you can actually do a dual mobility. And in that condition, it's, it's a great uh, point to do a revision shell where you can put in those kickstand stools into the superior pubic primus and the ischium and uh, a, a triflange uh, fixation with the uh, ileal screws. If not, then probably a, a constraint liner is an option. Is So that's the message I think, uh, sir, we're from your side, Dr. Madhotra, sir. Thank you. Yeah, so so we did, uh, so in in, in uh, establer fractures, fragility fractures in the elderly, yes, delayed primary fixations do have a role, but you have, uh, you can go in and do an acute total hip and the results have been uh, the same. I did try to find something on the establer fracture uh, total hip and, uh, and, and a deteriorating Parkinson's, but there was nothing. So that's what we did. We did impaction bone grafting and we did a constrained cemented cup with the cemented stem. And this patient was 87. He was 84 when we did uh, a bilateral total knee for him, staged bilateral. And he had a very, very happy, peaceful and pain-free three years before he passed away in, uh, uh, in 2020. So that was him. And that is the message in the literature with good to excellent pain relief <coughs> with all these patients, uh, even with deteriorating Parkinson's about uh, two to three years post total hips. Their problems essentially are related to fractures, periprosthetic fractures and dislocations. And the general walking ability is a statement of the deterioration of the disease per se, and not just the statement of the total hip. So Moving on to another case, and I would request uh, Dr. Sidak to come in on this. Uh, a, a young 37-year-old had a road traffic accident, uh, an untreated acetabular fracture with uh, a very poor uh, uh, a functional outcome score. And this is what she looks like. These are her CTs. If you, uh, so would you like to classify this defect, Dr. Sidak, and would that have any bearing on what you would do? Uh, yes, I think uh, it's uh, since it's a ne neglected uh, uh, four year old neglected acetabular fracture. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, Paparoski three already based on the yeah, on the CT scan going into three. Yeah, That's about right. And um, I think uh, since the patient is still young. Um, she, uh, she can benefit with uh, um, uh, impaction graf grafting with uh, um, uh, dual mobility. Uh, and um, yeah, so great points. Think, impaction grafting is, is absolutely what you're trying to say is yeah. essentially that you distalize and, uh, and inferiorize the femur give adequate optimal medial wall reconstruction. Dr. Rehan, can I get you on this? Uh, uh, would you do anything different here and how would you plan the establish uh, it's, yes. an, it's an uncontained defect. I think you need to convert it into a contained defect. So I think cages are very important. You know, cage constructs are very good and you can bone graft the back of it and put a cage in the front. Because see, otherwise, even if you have multiple screws and sometimes you see the migration, even cages migrate, but I think convert it into a con contained defect and bone graft the defect. And then I think your rim is intact, which is good, you know, so you can put a standard cup into it. Right. So dual mobility, yes, if this is a young lady who is active and wants to be active. Dislocation would be a big problem here. I think it's all stuck. So you need a lot of soft tissue releases, maybe head or neck osteotomy, as Professor Chen said already, uh, and maybe then take the head out or use it, ream it where the head is. So that will give you the bone graft. Uh, Ms., would you have anything to good. add? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Just a little, another surgical point. 
Yeah. If you want to do this kind of surgery and it's four years neglected, there's a lot of soft tissue to get out of the way. The entire capsule has been removed. If you do not do that, you cannot do this surgery. Yeah, great points, uh, uh, David. Anything else in the planning, Mez? Do you have something to add or we move on? I'll do an angiogram as well, just to see where the vessels are, because you're very close to your iliac vessels. So just to be sure that you're not going to have any surprises when you pull that head out. Great. Abhay, uh, just this is the kind of case where we would do the sandwich. We have plenty of such cases. Fill that up with the sandwich so that your base is really solid and put in a normal, any porous metal cup, veget uh, periphery is good. You'll get a good cup with a good brace and good uh, uh, bone stock buildup. Great point, sir. And so I think what what the message for the uh, for the audience is essentially that this is an uncontained defect. So you've got to convert it into a contained defect first. Build up the, the medial wall with graft or with a sandwich fixation, some kind of uh, reconstruction, and then you've got to distalize and lateralize the uh, the hip. And uh, just a quick question, Dr. Sensor, how worried would you be about uh, the abductors in this uh, patient? Uh, how much of a concern would that be? No, because the injury has not been primarily posterior, so the abductors are likely to be okay. It all depends upon the subsequent surgical approach. If, the, if this is not harmed by any way, so the abductors are likely to behave well. Absolutely. That's a very important point, sir, that probably the dysfunction is a relative abductor dysfunction if, there injury, if the injury is not predominantly posterior. And that's something which will help us uh, in the in deciding what we do. So just going ahead to what we did. So uh, all the points that the faculty have enumerated, that was the planning for this hip when you reconstruct the center of rotation as you would do on the contralateral side. So that's what we did. We did an impaction bone grafting. The capsule is usually intact and we use it as a, as a uh, scaffold to build onto the graft. Then you put in a wire mesh, put in more graft, and we could do a, with just uh, uh, autogenic graft uh, with a little mixture from fresh frozen aloe graft. And we put in a dual mobility cemented hip. And this patient is about four years post down the line after surgery, and she's doing extremely well and with no signs of loosening. So uh, any, any comments, any take homes before we no, move on well to another, another case? Um, Abhi, uh, the administration is saying that uh, we need to conclude. So we'll have discussion on this case, but this is going to be the last case. Of, okay, great, uh, sir. Sure. So, uh, so quick take homes. Uh, maybe can I request Dr. Shahid Noor sir to come in with quick take homes for uh, uh, for the two uh, C defects and uh, what would uh, the take homes be and your comments on the case and uh, would you would something else be needed to be done here? Yeah. Um, so I think if, first of all, the operating arthroplasty surgeon must understand the difficulty that this is not a simple primary complex. So if the patient